we are going to look on the ministry of the teacher or the functions of teacher we've looked generally at the ministry gift of teacher but now we're going to look deep we're going to dig deep on the ministry of the teacher what what he must do as a teacher number one he should never stop learning a teacher should never stop learning romans 2 21 says well then you who teach others do you not teach yourself that's a question you who preach against stealing do you steal in a way in ways that are discreet but just as sinful so his life is one of continuous study and preparation. We, we never stop studying. We never stop preparing ourselves as teachers. So there are daily lessons to be learned in the school of God's Holy Spirit. I like that. The Holy Spirit is a grand teacher who teaches all things. In fact, Jesus said he will reveal all truth to us. So when we inquire from the Holy Spirit, we're in that school. 1 Corinthians 2.13 We also speak of these things, not in words taught or supplied by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual thoughts with spiritual words for those, who, for those being guided by the Holy Spirit. So as the Holy Spirit guides us, we are able to combine and interpret spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. That's what we do as teachers because we are being guided by the Holy Spirit. When we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. Number two, he must know the word of God. As a teacher, you're supposed to know the word of God. Mark 12, 24. Jesus said to them, is this not why you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures that teach the resurrection know the power of God who is able to raise the dead. So we have to know the scriptures, not just by heart, but our lives, as we mentioned earlier on, it has, our lives have to be living epistles. We should be living epistles, letters to be read by men. So how, how should the teacher know the word of God? How must he know the word of God? Number one, he must be able to answer difficult questions. Wow. So that means we really need to search our scriptures. We really need to read this word, understand this word. Matthew chapter 22, verse 16 to 46. Let's look at the example of Jesus, how he tackled some questions. And I believe I'll just read the scripture and you get how he was able to answer them. They sent their disciples to him along with the Rodians saying, Teacher, you can start with that, just to mention. We know that you are sincere and that you teach the way of God truthfully without concerning yourself about what anyone thinks or says of your teachings. For you are impartial and do not seek anyone's favor. And you treat all people alike regardless of status. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it permissible, of course, that they were saying according to Jewish law and tradition, to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not. But Jesus, aware of their malice, asked, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin and you used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denaria that was a day's wage. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They say, The emperor Tiberius, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had this, they were caught of God, and they left him and went away. On that day, some Sadducees, <laughs> who say that there is no resurrection of the dead, came to him and asked him a question. So the Sadducees are saying they don't believe in resurrection of the dead. They ask him, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies, leaving no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his widow and raise children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, 
left his wife to his brother. The second also died childless, and the third down to the seven. So, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. But Jesus replied to them, You are all wrong, because you know neither the scriptures which teach the resurrection, nor the power of God, for he is able to raise the dead. For in the resurrection, neither do men marry, nor are women given in marriage. But they, all, they are like angels in heaven, who do not marry nor produce children. But as to the resurrection of the dead, have you not read in the scriptures what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Ijel, uh, Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when the crowd had this, they were astonished at his teaching. Now when the Pharisees heard that he had silence, so that he had muzzled actually the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, there you get, a lawyer coming forth, an expert in mosaic law, <laughs> asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied to him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. The whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. So now while the Pharisees were still gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. <laughs> What do you Pharisees think of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed? Whose son is he? They say to him, the son of David. Jesus asked them, how is it then that David, by the inspiration of the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord the Father say to my Lord, the Son, the Messiah, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So then, if David calls him the Son, the Messiah, Lord, how is he David's son? <laughs> no one was able to say a word to him in an answer. No, from that day on did anyone dare to question him again. So he must be able to answer difficult questions. That's part of knowing the word of God. Number two, part of knowing the word of God, he must be able to apply Bible truths to life situation. Application of the word of God. Mark chapter 9 verse 14, 29. When they came back to the other nine disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes questioning and arguing them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw Jesus, they were startled and began running up to greet him. He asked them, What are you discussing with them? One of the crowd replied to him, Teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit who makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, Intending to do harm, it throws him down and deforms at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes stiff. I told your disciples to drive it out, and they could not do it. He replied, O oh, unbelieving, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When the demonic spirit saw him, immediately it threw the boy into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Then Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he answered, Since childhood, the demon has often thrown him both into fire and into water, intending to kill him. But if you can't do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, You say to me, if you can. All things are possible for the one who believes and trusts in me. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out with a desperate, piercing cry, saying, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly, rapidly gathering around them, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After screaming out and throwing him into a terrible conversion, it came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse, so still and pale that many of the spectators said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he stood up. When he had gone indoors, his disciples began asking him privately, Why were we unable to drive it out? He replied to them, 
This kind of unclean spirit cannot come out by anything but by prayer to the Father. So Jesus applied what he taught. Actually, what he lived. So a teacher must be able to apply Bible truths to life situations. How can he also be able to know the word of God? The third, the third one, he must be able to firmly fix and ground new believers in the word. Hebrews 5.12 For though by this time you ought to be teachers because of the time you have had to learn these truths, you actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of God's word. From the beginning, and you have come to be continually in need of milk, not solid food. So a teacher must be able to firmly fix and ground new believers in the word. And that's why it is important to know the word. Why do we need to know the word? To be able to answer difficult, difficult questions. To be able to apply Bible truths to life situations. And be able to firmly fix and ground new believers in the word. So we've, looked, we've checked on uh, what is needed of a teacher. Number one, he should never stop learning. Number two, he must know the word of God, which has three things there. And number three, he must be able to teach by example. John 13, verse 13 to 14. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right in doing so. For that is who I am. So if I, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet as well. He was an example to his disciples. So if a teacher does not live by what he teaches, he will have no more effect than did the Pharisees. Wow. I have to live by what I teach. In order for me not to be put in that category of that grouping of Pharisees. Look at Matthew 23 verse 1 to 3. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples saying, The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in Moses' chair. That is a place of authority as teachers of the law. So practice and observe everything they tell you. Wow. But do not do as they do. For they preach things, but do not practice them. And I pray that you as a teacher and I as a teacher, we do not preach things and do not practice them. We have to preach what we practice, what we live. And we know Jesus always practiced what he preached. He did what he taught others to do. Look at Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The first account I made Theophilus was a continuous report about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. So he was doing then teaching. And that's the trend. Let's be living epistles. Let us be letters that can be read as the Bible says. So our greatest message come out of what we are, not what we say. Get that. What we are, not what we say. What you are, not what you say. Number four, he must teach clearly and accurately. 2 Timothy 2.15, study. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. Not man approved, but God approved. A workman, how do you become a workman? Tested by trial, what you're teaching. Who has no reason to be ashamed? Accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So a teacher must clearly convey the true meaning and purpose of God's word. Because this gift carries with it the responsibility to teach others accurately. Number five. A teacher seeks to bring others to his level of understanding. Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, 25. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a born servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the born servant like his master. 
Let me just leave it there. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and a born servant like a born servant like his master. Paul is a perfect example. I mean, he taught the full counsel of God as he knew it to those in, in his charge. He held nothing back that was for their good. Nothing he held back. Act 20 verse 20 and verse 27. You know how I did not shrink back in fear from telling you anything that was for your benefit or from teaching you in public meetings and from house to house. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose and plan of God. That's how our man it has teach us. Declaring the whole purpose and plan of God. Number six. The greatest reward of a teacher is to see lives changed by God's word. You just don't teach. You need a transformation taking place in the people who hear this word. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 5 and verse 14. And also Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 12 to 13. I'll just combine all those scriptures. Look, I have taught you state statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God has commanded me. So that you may do them in the land which you are entering to possess. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you the statutes and judgments. So that you might do them in the land which you are going over to possess. Assemble the people. The men and the women and children and the strangers. Look, cutting across generations, men, women, children, strangers. Those are resident aliens, foreigners within your cities so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God. They may hear, learn, and fear. Three things, hearing, learning, and reverence and be careful to obey all the words of this law so once they hear and they learn and there's reverence they are able to obey all the words of the scriptures there are children who have not known the law will hear and learn and fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you are crossing in the Jordan to possess very interesting. Those are key points. Hearing, learning, reverence. And that will be passed on from generation to generation. And it's a mandate for a teacher to do this. See lives being transformed by God's word. Not conform to the pattern of this world, but by the transformation of our mind. Our mind is a battleground. It needs transforming power of the Holy Spirit through the Holy Scriptures. So God's work, mighty miracles when taught, received, and obeyed. God's word. It works. It's alive. It's living, as the Bible says. It's living. It's not dead. It works mighty miracles when we teach it correctly. When we receive it correctly and when you obey it. So there is a part of teaching. There is a part of receptability. And there is a part of obedience. Number seven. A teacher should be supported by those to whom he ministers. I know this is a very controversial one. But in scriptures, he should be supported by, by those to whom he ministers. Look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 6. The one who is taught the word of God is to share all good things with his teacher. <laughs> Actually, it means contributing to his spiritual and material support. You know, uh, yeah. They should be. And the number eight, I want to go on that more. I'll discuss it when we're talking about giving. Number eight, he must be able to work full-time at his ministry. He must be able to work full-time at his ministry. Very important. Why? Because it takes time to pray. It takes time to study. It takes time to prepare and teach God's word. 
even for me to come up with all these studies, it, it takes time. I mean, I've been having this study for, I would say, maybe 10 years. Yeah, just putting things together, uh, searching scriptures here and there, some study materials, and what the Lord ministers in my heart. So it does take time. You know, just a one-time thing. It takes a lot of time. So that when you're giving something out there, it is accurate. It is accurate. It presents God's heart. So it takes time to pray. It takes time to study. It takes time to prepare. And it takes time to teach God's word. We can't rush on it. We can't. Teaching is hard work. Let no one cheat you. It's hard work. And that's why Paul encouraged Timothy to study, study, study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. I like that. Second Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 15. A workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. We've been called to do that, to accurately handle and skillfully teach the word of the truth. So, take time, do pray, do prepare, and teach God's word. It doesn't come the other way around. You pray, you study. As you pray, God will lead you, will direct you, and then prepare. And then you can teach God's word. Because a workman is worthy of his wages. If a teacher is not properly supported by God's people, the whole church will greatly suffer. In, that, in support, let me add, in support, it does just mean material. Pray. Pray for the teachers of the word of God that will present the word of God accurately and skillfully. Anointed. Anointed of God. That their teaching and their preaching will not be based in the wisdom of men. No way. But of power that leads unto salvation. That leads into transformation of the heart, of the mind. And that makes us to be well equipped. That's our prayer. Making us well equipped according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Onwards. And the last part of it. That it will make us to reach, will make us, all of us, reach oneness in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. That will make us to grow spiritually, that will make us to become mature believers. That will make us to reach the measure of the fullness of Christ. That will make us to manifest a spiritual completeness and to make us exercise our spiritual gifts in unity. That's why we need teachers. When teachers come and they are anointed of God and they impart this on our lives, we no longer be children tossed, you know, by every wind of doctrine, by the cunning and trickery of men, by deceitful schemings of people ready to do anything for their personal profit. But when we are taught rightly, the word of God will begin speaking truth in love. And our speech in our lives begin to express his truth. And we are able to grow up into Christ, following his example because he is the head of the church. Amen. I pray that by this great study, God will enlighten you to know the hope of his calling. Amen. Next time, we'll look at the warnings against false teachers. 
Amén.